17 licensed surveyors in the state of Nebraska as of this year. And of those, 146 actually reside in Nebraska. So there's a lot of out of state surveyors. Can you hear them? A little louder. Good. Yeah. All right. Um, there's 317 licensed surveyors in the state of Nebraska. And of those, there's 100 and Okay, there's uh, 141 of those are out of state licenses where they can come in and work in Omaha or wherever. So that leaves 176 licensed surveyors actually in Nebraska, the whole state. And of that 176, 76 of those are in Lincoln and Omaha. So that leaves 100 basically to cover the whole state. So it is kind of it's a kind of a long process to get licensed. Um, education requirements help. If you have a four-year degree in surveying, then you need about uh, four years of experience as a boss in charge. And you take uh, you have to take a land surveyor and training test, an eight-hour exam given by the state. And then you your application goes to the board of examiners. And if they will let you take the test, it's another eight-hour exam given by the state to get your license. So it took me about 10 years to get licensed. But that's why there aren't very many of them, I guess. And that's why we're glad to have you here. Uh, welcome to the third of the Science and History series on land surveying. And um, I think we'll probably be repeating this next fall, so I'm going to be working on a seismologist to talk about our fault lines and maybe take us out to the one by Humboldt that's exposed, a hydrologist uh, to talk about the river, and an anthropologist to talk about the people that lived here and built homes here in prehistoric times. Today it's on land surveying, and I'm just going to give you a little history before we get going with Rob. Um, in 1854, in April, some families came up from St. Joe and uh, built this log cabin, which is now on the premises of the Historical Society, but it was down by Dubois. But when they, when they settled, they settled in Kansas. And then they surveyed the line between Kansas and Nebraska, because there were two territories that needed to be divided up. And so when they did that, they discovered they weren't in Kansas anymore. They were Nebraskans. <laughs> so you can see that surveying makes a difference in big ways. Um, this is a survey transit that's about 100 years old that's in the uh, Veterans Museum right now. And it has a little history. We've had at least three surveyors um, that we know, um, Edmund D. Howe, they're all buried in the Tay Rock Cemetery, and then his son Orville Dwayne Howe took over, and then Lloyd Ratiska took over. And then uh, O.D. Howe was the county surveyor. I don't know, Rob will talk more a little probably about him. And uh, this is the Howe family, and you'll see E.D. Howe is the guy with the scruffy white beard, and O.D. Howe is the back row, second from the right. And then in the foreground, of course, is Lloyd Vertisca. And then this is his son, Jerry, who joined the transit survey on behalf of the family. And from here, we're going to let Rob kind of talk 
Rob, um, why don't you start talking about um, the surveying of the 40th latitude? Yes, here's, this is down south of Rulo, southeast of Rulo. Um, basically, Kansas, Nebraska Act, May 30th, 1854, created the territories of Nebraska, Kansas, which had to be surveyed before settlement could proceed. In November 1854, Captain Thomas Lee of the U.S. Army Topographic Engineers determined the 40th degree of north latitude along the Missouri River. On May 8, 1855, the cast iron monument on the bluff above was erected by Charles Manners to mark the beginning of the baseline of the 40th parallel formula state line. And then uh, in 1855 and 56, Manners surveyed west from that monument 108 miles to establish the initial point of the sixth principal meridian. The initial point controls the system of sections, townships, ranges of the public land surveys in Nebraska, Kansas, parts of Colorado, Wyoming, and South Dakota. The original surveys of Nebraska were completed in 1883. All land transactions, patents, deeds, and easements within Nebraska are filed with the register of deeds of each county and reference the corners set from these surveys. That's the monument right there. And where, tell us where it is, Rob. You go south of Rulo on Highway 70, or Highway 7, I guess, and uh, it's past the White Cloud turnoff or the casino turnoff. That, uh, that, this is right on the highway. This marker's right off the highway. It is a bit of a climb, because it's about 70 feet up on the bluff. There is a trail with a handrail there. Uh, I don't know how they got that up there, but. Does that mark the exact spot that they started from? Yep. I've actually surveyed that with GPS, and it's 40.0000 something. And, and the, they did this by sun, observing the sun and the north star. Uh, they had calculations to where it's all about sighting the north star and having a reference angle, and then an accurate timepiece. You wait a few minutes, survey it again, and that angle and that time, they can calculate the position. So that's, that's looking east. When they said that, the Missouri River was down at the bottom. Now it's 4,000 feet east. There's the 40 degree latitude. And that's what they actually said in 1854. Um, there is my GPS unit, and that is an original stone on the state line. Well, they have references to it. So anybody that surveyed it over the years, if you go to the courthouse or on the state surveyor's website, there are references that basically anytime you do a survey, you file that with the state so you can research that and say, okay, this guy found this 10 years ago, and you just got to try to, you kind of figure out where it is. And they don't get moved around? Well, maybe back in the early days, but once they get surveyed pretty well, and they have an angle and distance to them, they can be reset. And basically the GPS, it's been around since the 90s for the private sector, and it tracks satellites. So I got a, I've got a receiver on top, and then a base receiver somewhere else, and uh, when it first came out, you could track about eight or nine satellites. Now you can track about 40. Okay. Um, 
There's a stone, a yellow limestone. That's a corner. And I'll just show a few of these corners. Is that all right? What do you mean by corner? Section corner marker. So originally, when they started laying these things out, off of that baseline that they laid out, the state line, then they would go, uh, basically they, they would set guide meridians, 24 miles east and west, 24 miles north. So every 24 miles north, they would do a correction line for the curvature of the earth. Since the earth was round, you know, it's kind of hard to explain all this, I guess, but um, we were talking about it going north to Auburn or up Highway 105 and you see the highway curve, that's where they corrected up. They want the sections to run straight north, but since the earth is round, you have to correct up for the curvature. And they do that correction just in one spot? Yeah, every 24 miles. So 24 miles north of the state line, then another 24 and another 24. So that'd be about every township then? No, township is six miles. So every four townships. Okay. And really, if you go up there, you know, it's in Nemaha County, first township in, you drive down the road, there's a road going north, about four or 500 feet over, there's a road going south. We call it the county line dog. Over. Yeah. And same thing on the state line, Kansas, they corrected up a little differently and their, line, their roads don't line up either with Nebraska. But, but originally, off of that baseline, they ran at 108 miles west. Then they ran a line true north. Then they came back every 24 miles and set a line. 24, 24, then 24, 24 north, then another crew come in and set township lines. Six miles north, six miles west, back. Then another crew came in and set the sections within the township. So there's 36 sections in a township. They would start at the southeast corner, go north, then east and hit an existing corner, back, northeast. So when you look at a township and there's partial, you know, the very quarter mile on the north end of a township and the, the quarter mile on the west end of a township, that's where all the air goes. So you might, that 40 acres there, it might be 40.5 or it might be 39.5. So that, yes, yeah, so when they started chaining the north, and they were doing this with a, 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 an actual chain, I don't have a picture of one. And a compass. So they would drag this chain, 80 chains was a mile, 66 feet long, 100 lengths. And they'd plumb bob, if they were on uneven ground, they would plumb bob down to keep the chain level. And I got some maps here that maybe we'll see here in a minute. Oh, you put those all the way to the end. Okay. The chain didn't follow the topographic of the hill. What? The chain did you follow the topographic? Well, you got to keep it level. So you have a, you know what a plumb bob is, like a weight on a string. So the guy at the back, at the back if he's up on the hill, then you keep the chain straight and you plumb bob down to get over your point. And actually, when I started in the 80s, we were still doing that. Because we didn't have any electronics really back then, even in 1980. Can you go back to that previous slide? How long is the chain? 66 feet. 66 feet. So how far down do you have to take to find these? Well, that one's, I think, that one's pretty shallow. That one, you know, some of these roads, if they, I think about in the 40s maybe, did they start kind of, regrading all the county roads, putting ditches on them and making them so they would drain. A lot of times they would fill over that stone. A lot of times they got knocked out. So we've had excavators out quite a few times with a backhoe and it might be down six or eight feet. Um, but hopefully this How one... How you know when you found this, the right stone? They, actually in the notes, they noted what the size of the stone is. Um, 
a lot of times they were set on their edge. Um, sometimes they have an X on them. We got a couple of those. But just from prior notes also. And really, I mean, that one's pretty easy to tell, I think. <coughs> So there, see, you can see an old fence corner there. Sometimes that helps to locate them. There's one with an X. There's one by a corner. That one's kind of on edge. I mean, you know, it just doesn't look like it got thrown there. There's another one with an X by a post. So there's one, and then I put a county, you drive a 24-inch rebar and put a county cap on it to monument it. There's a, somebody put a pipe in there. I think that was Ben Dale. That's what he used to set probably back in the 50s. There's one, you can see that stone right there. I mean, it's hard to find stuff like that, but that was the stone. So you kind of survey where you think the stone's going to be and then look for the stone to corroborate where you are? Yeah, and you have original notes you can try to go off of. So if you find a couple corners and survey those, and then you can calculate where a lot of these, the general area. And did they always use stone? What no, sometimes they used uh, posts and stuff, but <laughs> they started setting iron probably in the early 1900s when it was available. So then you could use a metal detector and find them. Lloyd told me that uh, O.D. Howe used to use bottle caps sometimes. Yeah, I got a picture of that the other day. Now out west in the sand hills, they did pits and mounds. So they'd set the corner and they'd dig four pits around there, a foot deep, a foot wide, and then pile the dirt outside because they didn't have any truck, no trees and no stones out there. There's a fun one that was in the middle of winter and there's 20 inches of frost. And are you That's why there aren't that many surveys. <laughs> are you out there surveying all year long? Oh yeah. Does any time say, uh, a lot of my work is, uh, you know, back in the day we had all these farms farmhouse, farm there. Well now, a lot of the acreages are getting sold off the farm. Well, those have to be surveyed, so you have a legal description. And to start that survey, you really need two section corners to start. And you've got to show all your section lines on there and everything. Um, How long did it take you to dig through there? <laughs> I think it was about an hour. Um, that's what was down there. What is that? It's a pipe with a rebar in it. So you found the metal detector. Yeah, and I already knew it was there because I had notes that somebody found it about 10 years before that. I mean, I figured it was there. Now I've got a, uh, the best thing I bought was a rotary hammer drill <laughs> and put a bit on that, and that would cut through that pretty good. But before that was done with a six foot long iron pick, <laughs> iron bar. So here's a, here's a backhoe we're digging. That's, uh, cause that's the Gage County guy there. But you can see that little peak deal down here? That's the corner. And you can see the probe. A lot of times if we're looking for a stone, you just start probing and see if you can hit it, hit the stone. That one there, we were digging and I saw a little piece of wood. So I knew somebody had you know, put a stake there at one time. It looked like a wooden stake. And it was, it was a stone. Okay. So there's one in a road. Notice the hedge road where it dug up. That's one like Southwest Pointing County. I don't know who put that in there. Is that a stone or concrete? That's concrete, but they put a bar in there. 
There's one that's marking a quarter corner. They actually scratched the quarter on top. That's in Pawnee County. That's on the uh, Missouri River bottom, up by Berda. That is southwest of Russ Smith's house. That stone right there out in the woods. And it's, that thing goes in about three foot. That one, there's one, that's a stone. There's one by a corner we used, same picture. That one's just right by my house, south of Humboldt, down on the river bottom. And it actually, that's the same stone, it had an X cut in it. And there's some metal by it, that way I kind of knew can kind of get to that area and take that metal detector and it'll find metal, you know, two or three foot deep. Now, how long ago have some of these stones been set? 1855, originally. Mm -hmm. But when they were lost, a lot of times, uh, well, the Howes and even Lloyd, uh, they must have not had iron. They set a lot of stones even through the 50s and 60s. This is one that was a, uh, nobody had found that one before, but I found the ties to it, went out there and kind of figured out where it was and started probing and I hit it. There's one I dug, that's uh, David Blake's house right there in Pawnee County. I was looking for a corner, never found it. But you want to try to find them, because if you don't, and it's not that they're right or wrong, but the way our rules read, we're not supposed to correct any mistakes. We've got to retrace the original footsteps. So wherever they put that stone in 1855 is where we want to put it back. That is, uh, there's actually a pipe down there we found. You can't, right? Right there. The one inch pipe we found. That was out west of Pawnee. There is a government marker right there. I think it's a. Uh, it's a large on the next slide. Okay. Yeah. That's a Department of the Interior. That was a government survey right there. A lot of times, especially along the Missouri River, they had all kinds of issues down there because the river was moving. Missouri was claiming some, Iowa was claiming that, and they had a heck of a time back in the day. So they did a lot of surveying down there. And actually a lot of that was Indian land at the time. So that one's up in the hills there, just not too far off the state line, south of Rulo. That is a, an azimuth marker, so Back in the 30s, the government set a lot of these uh, triangulation stations, they're called. And that was before GPS. I think a lot of it was for missile launch and stuff like that. So they, they had latitude and longitude established on all these markers. There's one by the Ernie Blake farm up on top of the hill. It's still there. But they had a lot of them. Back in the day, there were a lot of them are gone now. So there's a reference so if I'm going to go look for that southeast corner of section four, so somebody, you know, Tom Catlett found that in the year 2000. He found a 5-H rebar, and then you set these references to that corner. And for the state of Nebraska, you've got to have a minimum of three reference points for each section corner and quarter section corner, and actually 16th section corner. So he's got a spike and a post and a spike and a telephone pole. And you can go find those, measure in, and then dig. So these reference things are all kind of more modern than 1855. 
Yeah, but they do. I think I got some notes here, even with O.B. Howe. He had reference notes, and the, there's a book at the courthouse in Pawnee that they just they do a survey and come in and write what they found in that book. And you go back in that old book and try to find it. How big is the section? One mile by one mile. Okay. 640 acres. So they set, originally, they'd set a corner every half mile. It's not. It's got an index, but it's really time consuming. And if I had a lot of time, I would try to, I'd have to go through every survey in there and try to organize it. Yeah, they would work here one day and somewhere else the next day. I'll show you. That's one from the state of Nebraska right there that they did. There's, there's some notes from Orville D. Howe on a survey he did in Pawnee City, I think, for John Barr, Block 9, Turner Edition, Pawnee City. Can you read that? Found stone at northwest corner of Block 1. Turner and Casey's, also a stone at the southwest corner of Block 5. This is in 1946. So then projected line and located west corner of Block 9 from this located east side of the block and set a stone Mark corners measured what that is measured comes at 120 feet and set stones located at the center of the block and so if I'm going to do a survey out there I actually go out and try to find these stones and sometimes I do but sometimes I don't but he said located centered Notched in sidewalk, so that sidewalk might not even exist. Yeah, anymore. and I'm thinking uh, in that particular case, yeah, I got out there and there's a whole new driveway and a sidewalk. So then you've got to find more reference points. Yeah, and that's the whole thing. And in any of these towns, you got to just try to find as many corners as you can, and you try to reestablish it off of the original plaque. And a lot of times they don't match up very well. Okay, here's this stone. This is out where Joe Binder lived in section 8, 3, 11. Um, hadn't been found since the 50s. And there's the bottle cap reference. That's an NIBC, they call it, nail and bottle cap. That's what's in my notes. And I, I Nobody found it because you had to actually cross this creek and hike up over a hill. So nobody went over there to look for it. And I went over there and there was the damn bottle cap. And I think I got the notes. Oh, that's a different one. But I, I got the notes to that too that said how far that stone was from the bottle cap. Because in Pawnee County, if you go out there looking for, in Richardson too, Western Park, and you're looking for a stone, there might be a whole bunch of them there. <laughs> That one, I'm not sure where that is. Okay, so there's a, this is the one, I think. This is right here south of Table Rock, right south of Metzger's house, that old fence line, there's a lot of brush out there in the middle of the field. That's a section line, that's actually a township line. And there was a stone there. And then that's an iron pipe on the side, on this side of that stone. Okay, here's the... Oh, so there are index cards. Yeah, there's index cards at the courthouse. So this one, this is section 8311. This is the one that had the bottle cap on it. And so the west quarter, um, which one was it? We can see how many. So we set a wax stone. NIPC is a nail-in bottle cap in a corner post, northwest 63 feet. Nail-in bottle cap to an REA pole, which was an old electrical pole, northeast 43. I think this is the one here. Nail-in bottle cap in a corner post, southeast 35.9. So 
I go find that bottle cap, measure 35.9, there's the stone. It was actually above ground. But they're not all that easy. A lot of times you get there and the whole thing bulldozed down. There's no fence, no hedgerow, no trees, there's nothing there. And that's really, in the last 10 years, we've lost a lot of those. So yeah, for, so if I'm going to do research, you always got to find all these section corners to start a survey. So a good courthouse, they got a card index. You can look them up on there. They got an old book like from the late 1800s. I look in there, there's sometimes there's some surveys in there. And then you could get at the state surveyor's office, they have everything online for all surveys after about 1999. And then each courthouse should have a survey record department where you go look at some of the older ones too. So here's some ties from Oracle, I'm thinking. 1936. For Walter Wenzel, section 17, township 311. So he found the stone at the southwest corner of 17 from Todd's. So found stone at quarter corner. Is it white, white rock? No, stone west side, section 8. Okay. That is that same, those are some older notes from that. Uh, that bottle cap picture we have. So he's got nail in bottle cap and gate post northwest 194. Uh, nail in bottle cap, corner post. Um, so then down there he says they chained and sighted between uh, right, one or two section corners northwest of 17. Then they set a white stone, six by six by twelve, with an X. So hopefully, you know, you go out there and you try and find, dig that up, and hopefully it's the one. And then, so he ties that all out. That was Orville D. Howe, yeah. You know? And then in 1956, that's how these, they're hard to index because there's 19, well, that might be 56, not 36. So then he did a survey for Henry Sharp. Section 7, found a stone, nail and bottle cap. And it's pretty specific, hedge stump, maple tree. Yeah, which those are all gone. So there's a, there's a plat of Pawnee City, original. So like if I was doing a survey of some lots here, you got to try to find enough corners to reestablish these lines. Sometimes that's a real problem. And in the back, when we're done, there's plat backs back there from 1885, 1917, 1949, and 1995. If you want to take a look. Rob, what's more challenging? You know, trying to find the lines in a township or? Or is it more challenging just to be agriculture out there? Um, it's all challenging, it seems like. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the towns, uh, like Elk Creek, it's laid out like at a 45 degree angle because they went with the railroad tracks. The railroad came through, they laid the town out parallel with the railroad track. Kind of the same in Dubois. So everything's at a 45, and you just, you try to find enough information to establish those lines, but I know I could go down G Street, Pawnee City, and find, you know, I've got seven or eight points, but hardly any of them line up. So you got one surveyor that maybe came in from Omaha, and they're like, well, we're just going to put it here, let's get back to town. Next guy comes in, well, I think it should be over here. Next guy, well, I think it should be over here. Basically, what I do is I just try to survey all I can, and you got to get this original plat and see how it fits. So when I when I survey these points on GPS or even on a that total station, I can download all that into my computer, and then I have software. I can label these points like stone, 
pi rebar, and it'll come in the drawing with the number and the description. So then I can draw the plaque on the computer, and I basically can just try to move it around until it fits as best you can. The section corners out in the country, if you're missing a corner, you've got to go find corners on each side, north, south, and east, and west, to reset that corner. And you have to use, you go back to the original notes from 1855, what they measured, and you measure that same distance, what they did, or the same points, and you do a proportion to make it fit. They call it a double proportion to, 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 to reset that corner. So like I said, I'm working on one southwest of Bircher. There isn't a corner for like three miles. And you don't, you don't really want to have to go that far because something's not going to be right. And that's what happened. The power lines are actually out of the county road right of way. That's why they called me. Hey, and by the way, I guess I am the county surveyor for Pawnee County and Richardson. So let's see. Hey, that's, go ahead. There you go. Just, there's, that's down at Rulo. They got that deer down there. So you're out. You're just, you're. That's in Rulo, believe it or not. Uh -huh. <laughs> there's, it's pretty, it's pretty woolly in, in Rulo. So you've probably been on every road in the two counties. Well, yeah. I think I got a picture of some up in the Barra Hills here, yeah. too. That's the Missouri River right there on the edge. There's one in Barrett. So you're not going to find a stone that deep. They're done washed away. Okay, so here's, what is that? That didn't come out too good, did it? Okay, this is in Richardson County. This north line is the Great Nemaha River, they call it. Not the one they got now, but that's the old channel. So in 1855, that was still Indian land. And that goes, that's like Honey Creek, like 8,500 acres that they had for the Indians. And the government could not lay out anything on that reservation. So they came from the north and, and laid out sections to the north bank of the river. Then, I believe it was in 1872, they were able to get on the Sac and Fox Reservation, or they got them out of there. Then they surveyed from the state line. That's a state line on the south. Um, in fact, I think that's might be Salem right there where that square is. That's a, that's a cornfield, basically. Okay, that's the same deal, only on the north side. So they laid out everything on the north, but they couldn't get in. This was Indian land. This, this was surveyed in like 1835. That's called the half-breed track line. There's a sign up at Auburn there on the highway east of Auburn that the government was going to give half-breed people this land. It was about 10 miles parallel to the Missouri River from state line clear up to Auburn. And most of them never seen it. The government, they're a bunch of crooked guys, believe no, it or not. Say it ain't so. And they bought all that stuff from the half-breeds for like pennies and kept it. So that didn't work out too good. There's the half-breed line there too. And actually there's monuments. We have to show that on surveys yet. Do that. This is the Iowa Tribe Reservation. That is South Arulo. <laughs> Same thing. I think it was 1892 before they got control of that from the Iowa tribe. That's the Demaha River on the north. So if you're doing a survey on the north side of that, 
you have to find corners just on the north. You can't find one on one side of the river and one on the other. You can't connect them up because they are two different surveys. They surveyed that into 40 acre parcels and they went east and west. They, they laid it out totally different than everything else. This here, this is a railroad, first, this is a railroad track they laid through there first thing. So it gets a little interesting. So you go down there to survey on the Iowa tribe land, there's a corner every uh, 40 acres. They divide, they set pins on every 40 acres instead of 160. That's another, that's in Richardson County, that's the same thing. To the south is Indian land that they couldn't get on at the time. I think that says west line of a, they had quite a few roads. These are trails that were there in 1855. Oh, Indian trail. Oh, roads. There's Indian trails also, but those are actually, there were settlers there. There was a lot of them, I guess. Um, so you can see that was the Great Emaha River there. And kind of got to go off of these maps. There's one that's north a little bit, but that's the Missouri River. This was a slough. And somehow they they winged that one because they weren't they couldn't walk through it, I guess. It was just a slough of trees and stuff. They had a heck of a time, I guess. And the river moved quite a bit from there, so that changed all that. Now, if the river moved, because the river would move a mile or two one way or the other, the Missouri River, right? So, how did the Iowa or Missouri lines, how did they? Well, the Corps of Engineers, I think it's in the 40s. They went through and decided this is where it's going to be and made the channel, and that's it. And that's, then there was lawsuits. There's a, you know, McKissick's Island from Auburn. It's on the other side of the Missouri River, but it's part of Nebraska. There's maybe, what, 800 acres or something like that over there? Yeah, same thing down in St. Joe's. The river changed in 1952, and there is Missouri on the west side of the Missouri River. Yeah. The French Bottom. This one here, I'm thinking, <clears throat> that didn't come out as good as it. What I was saying though on these townships, you see these little numbers up here on the north and the west. That's where their error went when they were, because they were supposed to start here, go over, set a corner, go over, check, up, back, up, back, and get up to here, and that's where all your error went. But these are trails, these are roads. Um, I'll show one, I think I got one here in Barrett, uh, how much, there's a lot of them on that. That's another, that's the Iowa tribe land that, that was in 1892. They got that finally out from the Indians. Okay, this one, this is like Barrett. The Missouri River is up in the northwest, northeast corner. But look at all, those are all roads or trails back in the day because of all the traffic on the Missouri River. There was a lot of activity going on there. Um, some of those, they must have had something in Blue Springs, because there was a lot of roads from Blue Springs to Nebraska City to Argo was a town that they had on the river. Deroyne was a town on the river. But these are all roads which I can't, you go up there and I don't know how you get a, a, a team and a wagon up and down some of the hills without killing yourself. That's like, oh, that's probably north of Falls City. And it's, these, are, these are all the old maps that, like I said, when we reset a section corner, you go back, and they got numbers here. 80 chains is a mile. That says like 79.44. That's what they chained for that mile. So if you, if you survey those corners, 
you've got to do a proportion of what they shot and what you shot to reset a corner. Here's, these are original field notes from 1855. Commenced August 27, 1855, and uh, I think they're setting up and they're actually doing uh, North Star shots. <laughs> I was I kind of like this one. Here they had a they had like a, they had a crew chief. Uh, two. Two chainmen, which are the guys that are pulling the chain. They had an axe man that was cutting the trail. And they made them take an oath that, uh, that I will execute the duties of chain. And I will blah, blah, blah. I can't really read it. But they had to sign it. And it's notarized by the government. Okay, that's all I the rest okay. of it. Yes, you can see here's the chainman, chainman, axeman, flagman, flagman. So before they have radio, they you can do flag signals to tell them you got the shot. And what follows is 150 pages of PDF. So I just oh, that's put all this on. If, if somebody wants to look at them, you can come up to the computer and have got them there. So being a surveyor, you have to be pretty physically hardy then. Yeah. I mean, out here, when I was in Omaha for 16 years, most of our work was construction staking. Um, I did 12 miles of Interstate 29 two summers. I mean, when you're staking pavement, you got to put a, you got to drive a woods, wooden hub in every 25 feet, probably four lines across for 12 miles. Wow. Um, <laughs> but how do you deal with curves? You calculate your curves. See, before we had all this, uh, all the laptops and all that, you hand count a lot of that. You know, you can hand count curve. You just got to hand count each point. Then we got HP calculators, and we counted off of that. Then we got like an HP 48 handheld calculator, and it actually had a program that you could punch it in. But you know, back in the earliest part of my career, when we would go to lay out a subdivision in Omaha, I mean, we just had a basic instrument with no electronics. You kind of lay out the control for the street, set up on there, turn to 90, set a point, and then you just start, if you're on a straight line, you just start pulling the chain, 25 or 50 set points, grade it for an elevation. If you're on a curve, you got a hand calc, point. And so all the way from the Kansas Nebraska state line all the way up into South Dakota, they're they're doing that and keeping it fairly accurate. On section corners? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, well, that was all done in the eighteen hundreds. And like I said, even if they made a mistake, you want to try to put the corner where they put it, not where it really should be. And a lot of notes I get that I've looked at from the Howells, they go out, find a hedgerow out here, and, and call that the point, start, and away they go. <laughs> so what's the average age of the certified surveyors in Nebraska? I don't know. Um, it's going to be a problem, because there just aren't that many of them. And it's not? Maybe younger ones coming Not out. really, because there's a lot of different directions. I mean, there's a lot of data management now, GIS. Um, they have things out now. They've got what they call a scanner. You can actually set this on top of the, a vehicle and drive down the highway, and it's spinning and shooting points, and it creates a cloud, and you can bring it in and process it, and it maps everything, signs, pavement, everything. Um, will, they, will there be a point where they won't go looking for these stones? Well, I mean, the more stones we find and then you have a record of them, at some point I'm assuming they're going to be on a on some kind of a map and, and you can probably do it with your computer. But for around here, especially, you know, where we're at down here, a lot of places haven't been surveyed ever. Well, 
if I go, I do research at the courthouse, there's no record of the survey for quite a, quite a bit of it. Or it has been surveyed in 1855, but not since. Right. Rob, back in the day, you know, years and years ago, like, I have my grandparents' house. And there's buildings around the neighbors. And a lot of times it seemed like they, they built like a garage right on the property line. Sometimes it may have been a little over, you know, but um, I know nowadays there's these setbacks, like I think it's five feet or something like that. When did they change to that? Um, That's like a, that'd be like each town, you know. Oh, when they, when they um, need to change? Actually like Pawnee County actually have zoning rules you can't put a boundary line within 20 feet of a building in Pawnee County. You can't have an acreage less than three acres in Pawnee County. And Nemaha County also. Richardson County doesn't have anything like that for some reason. And, uh, but yeah, the zoning uh, and setbacks, it's a big deal more in the bigger towns, but they're trying to do that now. So, you know, I guess just so you're not right on the line. Well, in Lincoln, I had a house, and I mean, it was from the 1920s, and there was a garage there, and then right next door, the other neighbors, there was another garage. I mean, they were like almost touching roofs. Yeah. So, um, you know, that could be a challenge, like if something caught fire. But yeah, and that's probably why they had to try to change that, I would imagine. Um, that's the way my house is. Matter of fact, I almost couldn't buy it because the neighbor's garage is in disrepair and it was actually leaning on my garage. Oh gosh. <laughs> well, do we have any other questions here? Yes, Jim. Roger. I, I had a question. When they laid out the railroad, what was the elevation, maximum elevation that they shot for <clears throat> me for a train to go? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, could you go up hill from like down to Depot yeah. to Pawnee City? Yeah, I know. Um, when you research the railroad, if you're doing any boundary survey along there, most of their legal descriptions are 50 feet from the center line of the existing track. That's their legal description. And really, you can't get a lot of information from the railroad. It's just almost impossible. But I know I was doing a survey west of Tecumseh, and it was a 50 foot from the center line of the railroad, but it wasn't, didn't look right. Went back to the courthouse and dug some dug in the bottom drawer and uh, found a one little drawing that said the railroad track had moved over 12 feet in 1901. <laughs> so that moved the boundary over 12 feet. I mean, it's it's hard to catch all that stuff. Yeah, one other question. Yeah, you, you had a bean field and a corn field up there, and the marker was like three rows into the bean field. Yep. Uh, Explain that. Was that a dispute on the property line? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I run into that all the time. Or? Yeah. Yeah, because that's the line, is that monument. Um, I've had one where the guy took out a hedgerow, and then he called me in to survey the line, Well, the hedgerow was 30 feet over the line. It wasn't even on his land. <laughs> <laughs> So I might actually own half a Humboldt and not even know it. Yeah, right. <laughs> but they, I did find this on the internet this morning about, it said the dangers and hardships by the pioneer surveys. It said the Indians everywhere understood when they saw the survey parties making mounds and driving stakes and digging holes that the white men were coming to take their land. And in many cases, they pulled up their stakes tore down the mounds, drove off the surveyors. And they also had great storms swept down on the surveyors that were living in tents and men and horses were frozen to death. Fever and A-G-U-E, whatever that is, A A play, was common in the camps. Um, in surveying the islands of the Platte River, because there's a lot of islands in the Platte. And there's always, they had to survey them up. They were wading through the water. They had a lot of mosquitoes, gnats, green-headed flies. Um, sometimes the Indians set fire to the prairie and drove the survey parties in because their horses had no grass to eat. 
And the saddest day in all the surveys of Nebraska was August 20th, 1869, when a band of Sioux Indians under Pawnee Killer and Whistler attacked the Nelson Buck survey party of 10 men in the Republican Valley and killed the entire party. They said uh, there was not a single season from 1863 until 1877 when the surveyors did not have to fight the Indians and for many years later, all survey parties carried rifles along with their instruments. So I got it easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you just get around with it? got traffic. <clears throat> I do, yeah. I mean, at this time of the year, it's a lot easier. I mean, unless it gets frozen, but at least I can access, uh, you know, when the crops are in, uh, it's not fun hiking through a cornfield in, in August. Yeah. You're not carrying a list. I live on Highway 4, and somebody's putting on new markers, I think on the mile line. Is that stated? Is that you know, where the new paving is? Or on Highway, Highway 4? Yeah. Northeast of Virgin, where I live. Northeast of Virgin. Oh, those are uh, the state. Are, the state's putting out these. They're, they're control points, basically, and they've got them on a lot of highways. Um, like on Highway Four here, where they they just tore it all up, right, and repaved it. That's on a section line. So the state got a hold of me and I went out and surveyed all the section corners that I could find on that highway. They tore them all out by repaving and now I got to go back and reset them again because they're gone. Um, but those points, they got a cap on them and it's uh, this Department of Roads and they're basically control points. They're, they've done them along Highway 50, they're on Highway 80, they do, they do a lot of them. I think it's part of the control for section corners, but a lot of it is when they want to redo a highway, you know, to, to redesign a highway, you actually got to go out and survey everything within that right of way and pass so they can design the highway, uh, cuts and fills and all that. And another, I know one other kind of information back in the 90s. The state of Nebraska decided to go to the metric system for about three years. We surveyed any state job had to be done in the metric system. And uh, so that caused a lot of problems. Uh, I know we built a bridge. Uh, my nephew, my brother-in-law and I, I got a survey job. Uh, I won the bid on that bridge uh, west of Wahoo. And it was all metric. We laid it all out in metric. You can't convert, you got to do it in metric. It doesn't work. Uh, yeah, I think that's. So, um, afterwards, if you're interested, Rob brought a couple of surveys here. And one of them is of the old Disney Hall. And the, field, the notes are with it, and it's really interesting what they have to follow. So, I'll put it back there by the platform. My sister Sherry made cookies this morning. There's some bottles of water, so help yourself to any cookies. We don't have a field trip with this one, so nowhere to go. So just kind of. We can go to Southwest Berkshire and try to find some corn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone bring their hiking boots. Yeah. <laughs> if you go out to the region, you can bring the show of the property lines are back there. But oops, Sherry. Back in the day, before the electronic one, I had a survey class in college, and to do that tripod, you had to balance, you know, the, the scope this way and this way, and if he was off just, you know, you could be shooting 100 yards away in just a half, a distance, you could be minutes, I mean, minutes. When I first started surveying, to a school in Rapid City, South Dakota, and it was geared towards oil exploration. They called it geophysical survey. So when I got down, uh, I got through the school, I got hired by this outfit in uh, West Texas, and we had an instrument called a plane table and alidade, and it actually had a compass on it. And I was just a rod man on the crew, and the chief, party chief set it up, and we got way off. Well, we looked, he 
set it up right beside a big pile of iron oil pipe. <laughs> and it threw the compass way off. Mm. We had to go back and start over. Rob, if a person wants to have their property surveyed, like I'm in Humboldt, I'm thinking about putting up a fence, <clears throat> my neighbor's got a different idea of where the property line is. Does it, I mean, since you're kind of a sole Mohican, I mean, do you have to get on a list? You know, what are kind of costs are involved? Do you, is it, is it yeah, based on how much time you have to spend on it? Or Basically, I mean, I have a list. I've, got, I've had 30 jobs in front of me for years. But the thing is, you never know what you're going to run into. If somebody's done a survey and everything looks pretty good, then that's one thing. But, uh, a, lot of, a lot of these smaller towns, Pawnee's got some problems in areas. There just isn't enough information out in the field to determine exactly where some of that is. So you end up just doing what you can. And, and, uh, <coughs> yeah, just call me. I can leave a card here. and. Uh, Okay, just curious. Yeah, I'm <coughs> about every town around here for sure. Uh, I just run into one, well, uh, like in Humboldt, you got Highway 105 running through. That's a state highway, but there's no deeds for it at the courthouse. So I had to do a survey along that highway. I go down there, there's no, there isn't a deed for it, but the state owns it. So technically, they own to the center of Portland. And so I get a hold of the state of Nebraska, and no, that's not right. Well, then they send me a set of plans, but it still doesn't, you know, there's still no explanation for it. So sometimes you just, you just got to make the best out of it. And, uh, I think that's one thing I try to do is I'll spend a little more time. I'll try to spend as much time as it takes to try to get it right. If you got a crew from Lincoln or Omaha or somebody out of town, they're not going to spend a lot of time to work on something. And I get it. I work for a big corporate engineering company, and it's all about making money. You can't spend two days working on a section for it. But then once it's done, then yeah. for decades, you It should be, yeah. I mean, sometimes there's some surveys on the state line down here that People got in a hurry and actually said they said something, but actually didn't. And so you run in, you don't even know about that till you get there. You know? How do you get interest in serving them? Um, you the military or? Yeah. Um, there was, uh, I think I always wanted to do something outside and, and uh, I remember a recruiter called me to go to this school, and it was about working in the oil fields. And back then, that was you know it was all about big money back then, right? And I get down there, and it really wasn't that big of money. <laughs> it was a lot of work, is what it was. And then when I got up here, uh, like I said, to get licensed, I think I was here. I worked in Lincoln for an engineering company, then to Des Moines, and then Omaha. Omaha 16 years up there surveying. Ended up uh, was a survey manager for a couple different engineering companies. But I kind of the oil exploration survey, they would they would give us like a township map. And then they would have a line drawn across it. It might be two miles, it might be 20 miles. <coughs> and we would lay that line out and survey elevations. And then those vibrator trucks would come along. We would do that. I don't know how long that I walked halfway across Texas for sure. Mm -hmm. But it, it is kind of interesting. I know, um, like even surveying here at Table Rock around the square, I found some old notes. I think it was O.D. Howe, set of stone. Well, for some reason, nobody <coughs> else ever looked for it, I guess. But I went over there and dug down a little bit, took a probe and dug it up. Now there's a stone right there. And that's the corner. So it is kind of unique to find one of the old stones. A lot of times, too, 
and I have this now, there'll be a creek that runs all over and they're like, they want to sell something, they'll say, well, we'll call the boundary line will be the creek. Well, back in the old days, they wrote a legal description that said, thence along the creek. Well, now we actually get to get in that creek and survey it and, and show how it is, basically. But if the creek's changed, then the land has changed. Yeah, but it depends how you write your legal description. <laughs> if you say along the center line of the river, or I survey it and it's along the, sur along the center line of the river at this angle at this distance. What's a meets and bound? That's a, that's a legal description. So you could have a legal description that says uh, Southwest border section 10 township two north range 11. I mean, a meets and bounds is gonna start from the Southeast border, then it's north two degrees, 52 seconds, you know, this many feet, then it's northeast, this bearing and this distance. And I got some surveys back there on the table that, have all that on there. It could be quite a, it could be quite a, a drawn out legal. I had one south of Humboldt and the creek just it meandered back and forth. And I told the gal, I said, you want to do that or just do a straight line? Well, I want each. I want that side. So I know this is my land on this side of the creek and that's their land on this side. So I had a hundred, over a hundred bins in that. And each one has a bearing and a distance. And how do you charge for that? Do you charge by time? I try to keep track of my hours. How long do you think you're going to be able to keep doing this? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, I'll be the county surveyor of Richardson County at least for another four years. I'm hoping at least another five or ten, maybe. Do you have an apprentice or anybody that shows any interest? You no, know, it's, I tell you, younger people you take them out there, and, you know, they think there's an easier way to make a living. And, and I think a lot of it, it does take a while to get to this point. You've got to pay some dues. Well, and it's probably a career that young people don't even know about or think about. Yeah, except. there was a school in uh, Milford for years, but. They're, they're, they're struggling to get any kids in there. But, and it's just like the stuff we're talking about. You really need some experience because there, there are a lot of just decisions <laughs> that it's not going to be black and white. you got to make a call about, you know, we're, we're going to use this and this and go this way. And when you send that in to the state, they're usually checking it. <laughs> Any more questions here? Hope you enjoyed this program. Had cookies, talk to Rob, uh, suggest ideas for other things for the historical society to do. We're always looking for ideas of what people were interested in. And uh, I guess I didn't mention this is the Howard Morrison series. Howard Morrison graduated from Table Rock in 1938. And when he died just a few months shy of 100, uh, his will provided uh, for a donation to the Historical Society. We, we're using the largest part of it to renovate the Legion Hall. We've just been able to put a roof on it, get a lot of brickwork done because it was starting to collapse. And we'll be, it's slow, you don't see much going on because it's just in fits and spurts, but he left us enough that we're going to get that building back together eventually. And we're using money for programs to bring people in, just whatever they're interested in. So, thank you for coming.